Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's so good to be here with you today. Um, and yeah, welcome back to all of our college students. So glad that you have uh, chosen to join us. I saw the whole Roberts soccer team coming in. Uh, so may you go uh, completely undefeated this season. <laughs> That's God's plan. I don't know. <laughs> right. Okay. So I want to start this morning with a, a question. How does somebody go about transforming themselves? How does that happen? How does that happen for you? How does that happen for me? Um, I, I know that my mind immediately goes to thinking about uh, like some kind of self-improvement system or something like that. And one of the things that I really enjoy volunteering and doing is coaching sports. Um, I love sports, and um, I coach uh, my son's basketball. Actually, I coach with some of the um, dads here at the church, um, some different sports. And uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about sports is there's so many lessons that can be learned uh, for all of us, but for young people especially, of uh, being a good teammate, of respecting authority, working together, all kinds of things. And, and part of what I do here at the church is actually coach some ridiculous children. Um, you know, it, you know <laughs> it's part of what I do, uh, not just in my volunteer work as well. But um, I, I love coaching because I love what it can do to a young person's mind. But for you, how do you transform yourself? Maybe it is that you have a coach. Maybe it's uh, that it's some kind of education that you're getting. Maybe it's through talking with somebody, a friend. Maybe you just want to get more disciplined, and so you're really focused on that. I looked it up this week and saw that the self-help industry is now valued at 38.3 billion, <laughs> with a B, dollars. And uh, in the next 10 years, it's projected to more than double to be at 81.6 billion dollars. So if you're thinking about writing that self-help book, you should and go make a billion dollars. Just don't forget to tie it to your local church. <laughs> so why is it that this industry is so big and so successful, I think honestly, it is because all of us are craving changing something about ourselves. Like it, it could be our looks, it could be our health, it could be growing in some kind of skill from skiing to cooking to all sorts of kinds of things. You want to just be able to say no to ice cream one time in your life. Like, like all of us want to change something about ourselves. And there's a lot of products for sale to help us. But the problem is, is that many of these things that we attempt to do, some of them really help, some of them really don't. But what a lot of uh, these transformation kind of promises end up doing is they, they change our external behaviors. But what we're actually longing for is something much deeper. Like what we're looking for is a change in how we can experience life. How we could change how we actually think about ourselves and about others. And today, what I want to talk about is the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit can actually transform our hearts and our lives. But the first question I want to get out of the way is maybe you don't have a lot of church background or anything like that. Um, the first question is, what is the Holy Spirit? And what I would say is uh, that question is actually the wrong question because the Holy Spirit is not a what. It's not a thing. It's not a force. The Holy Spirit is a person. So the right question would be, who is the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit is part of a Trinitarian God. It is one God in three persons. So there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you're like, wow, this is super confusing already, that's okay. I honestly believe that the Trinity is both one of the most beautiful things in all of Christendom, how God could be in perfect communion and relationship with himself, with the three persons, but I also think it is the most confusing thing as well. So if you don't fully get it, I don't think our finite minds are supposed to fully understand this on this side of heaven. But today, what I want to do is talk about who the Holy Spirit is and talk about how he wants, desires to transform your heart and your life. 
And I have conveniently alliterated this in four points for you, so you can help uh, remember this uh, beyond today. So the first way that the Holy Spirit wants to change our lives is through the gift of conviction. And just a side note, I'm going to kind of be using the word transform and change interchangeably today. Um, so if it, just so you know, I know there's slight nuanced differences, but just so you know how I'm using them. But the Holy Spirit wants to change us through conviction. And conviction is really just an awareness of our own sin. It's, it's knowing that I have not lived up to what is God's standard in my life. And that is true for every single one of us in this room and online. But it's, it's different than somebody like catching you in sin. That's, that's not really conviction. It's more like being coached away from and out of sin. It's the act of the Holy Spirit showing us and revealing to us that we have some wrong thinkings, we have some wrong doings, and to reveal some of our blind spots, how we, our actions, our thoughts might just be a bit off. Now, Jesus, when he was here, he said something I think is pretty provocative. He said a lot of provocative things, actually. But one of the things that he said is about the Holy Spirit, and he refers to the Holy Spirit as the advocate. And this is what he said. But in fact, it is best for you that I, Jesus, go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. So Jesus, while he's here on earth, says, it's actually better that I wouldn't be right here physically with you. It's better that I go away because the Holy Spirit is going to come. And so the question is, what is the role of the Holy Spirit? Why is it so good? Is it that the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to encourage um, every one of your thoughts, dreams, hopes are all going to become true? What is the role of the Holy Spirit? This is what Jesus goes on to say in the very next verse. He says, and when the Spirit comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness. So part of what this Holy Spirit does is he convicts us. And for us, conviction is honestly uncomfortable a lot of times. But I want you to think about it in this way. What conviction does is conviction leads us to repentance and repentance leads us to freedom. And that is the business that God is in, is coming to give us freedom. And so for you, even if you're made aware of your own sin, of your own wrongdoing, you have the opportunity at that point to go to God, the God of forgiveness, that's the very character of who God is, and you get to say, I'm sorry, Lord, will you forgive me? And here's the thing, this is what scripture says about our, our own confession of our sin. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all wickedness. This is, this is who God is. God is wanting to forgive you. He's wanting to convict us and then help lead us to repentance, which then leads us to freedom and away from our own path that can lead to our own destruction. So really, if I think about it like this, if the Holy Spirit, uh, wasn't a, a part of, of the Trinitarian God and, and didn't really offer forgiveness, then conviction would be like unkind because it would just be like revealing what's wrong with you without a solution. But there is a solution to it and it's Jesus's forgiveness that comes and marks us for eternity. Amen? Amen. So I, I, wanna, I wanna pause here for a moment and talk about conviction versus condemnation because I think these things can get confused for anybody, but I think especially for Christians, because conviction, what it does is it leads us to hope and to new life, but condemnation just leads us straight to shame, straight to feeling embarrassed and, and shameful about who we are and about what we have done. And, and what I want you to know is that God is not a God of condemnation. Like that's, that's not who he is. It says this in Romans. So there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus. That, that's not who God is. God is not here to condemn you. God is here to free you. And so because of this, we can see 
that when we are convicted, when we're made aware in whatever way of our own sin, it is a gift from the Holy Spirit to get us back on track to follow God's best plans for our lives. This is part of the power of the Holy Spirit and how he wants to transform us. But there's another way. Our second way that we'll look at today where the Holy Spirit wants to change your life is to be changed through the content of scripture. God wants to use his word to help shape and mold you and me, not for his own benefit, but for our benefit to become more like him. And the Bible exists to help us really understand the truth about, uh, about ourselves and about who God is. I love the way that the author of Hebrews writes it when he says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Scripture is incredibly helpful for you and for me in understanding why we are the way that we are. You ever feel like that sometimes? You're like, I don't, I don't get why I'm like this. Scripture is really helpful at exposing our innermost thoughts and desires, our motives for why we do some of the good things or the bad things that we do. Like even some of the good actions I take might be motivated by a wrong, like I'm just trying to make myself look good, like I'm a good Christian out here. Sometimes the Holy Spirit can even reveal those kinds of things through conviction or through the power of Scripture. Now, the truth about Scripture, though, is this is a book that was written by many different people thousands of years ago. And so sometimes for you and for me, we read it and we don't know what the heck we're reading. <laughs> we honestly get kind of confused. And when we get confused, I don't know if this happens for you, but this happens for me. Like I'll get discouraged and I feel like I've been reading this thing for so long. I, I just I still don't get it. And then it makes me want to push it aside and no longer read it anymore. And I wish that wasn't the case, but it's a temptation for me, especially when I feel like I don't know what's happening. But this is part of the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's that the Holy Spirit wants to help us understand who God is, what God is like, and who we are and how we are made in his image. And this is, this is part of the gift that the Holy Spirit gives to us. And I think sometimes for us as Christians, we're just like embarrassed to admit that we don't get all of scripture. Like we want to have an answer for everything, but we don't have an answer for everything because we aren't God. Newsflash here. I know. Write that down. It's brand new information to you that you are not God. I, I remember uh, this week I was driving in the car with my son. He's 10 years old. And just out of the blue, he asked a question. I love, I love car rides because it's like all the distractions are, are gone and can, can be focused conversation. And the question he asked me is he was like, hey, dad, so why is it when God created the garden with Adam and Eve that God created the bad tree in the middle with the forbidden fruit? Like, wouldn't it have been better for God if he just never even made that an option so that this world wouldn't be so messed up. <laughs> I was like, uh, go ask your mom, um, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so <laughs> no, I, so I, I said to him, honestly, I, I don't fully know the answer. And I tried to give him some of the ways I understand who God is and why this might have been and free choice. And I, you know, I said, but honestly, I don't fully know this answer, but this is a great opportunity for you to talk to God about that. And what I could tell you, buddy, is that probably if you, if you ask him like right now, it's not just going to plop right into your mind. Maybe it will. It might be something that you continue to ask and you continue to grow in for like years of your life. And that's not just true for a 10 year old. That's true for you and for me as well, because the Holy Spirit helps us and it helps grow our, our spirit and our soul over time to be more and more connected to him. I love this story in, in Acts chapter 8. It's between Philip and what the Bible labels as the Ethiopian eunuch. And uh, they have this uh, uh, really interesting interaction where um, Philip is prompted to go 
and to talk to this Ethiopian eunuch and they stop, he stops his chariot. They start this conversation and Philip is like, Hey, what are you, what are you reading? What are you learning about? And the Ethiopian eunuch says like, I've been reading this prophet from Isaiah, but like, I just do not understand these scriptures at all. And so Philip goes and he breaks it down and he actually shows him how, hey, this is from, you know, the Old Testament. This is from hundreds of years ago. What the prophet Isaiah said, he actually wrote it about Jesus and Jesus came and he was the fulfillment of this really complicated passage you're reading that you can't really understand. And what happens is that Ethiopian eunuch says like, oh my goodness, his, he, he sees in that moment the truth of who God is and how he came back for him. And he accepts Jesus on the spot. They even go down, they find a little river and he's baptized right in that moment by his new friend, Philip and the, and the Ethiopian eunuch, his life is changed for the rest of his life and for the rest of eternity. And I think it's, it's a great, amazing story that I believe really happened because I think that God prompted Philip in an amazing way to get through a gift of an angel, actually in this story, but like God prompts Philip to do this. And then as the Ethiopian eunuch is trying to understand it, God uses Philip to help him understand the scriptures in a new and powerful way. And this is what the Holy Spirit does is he helps us understand who God is. And so for you, the next time that you are reading scripture and you feel like I don't get it. Number one, no, you're not alone. Your pastor up here just said he didn't get it all the time either. But number two, uh, you can go and you can find resources. You could talk to a friend. All of that is great. But you know what I would say is first start by just talking to the spirit. Talk to God and say, like, I don't really get this or like I'm having a hard time focusing or whatever it is. Like part of why we read scripture is to connect with God. And so pause when you are stuck and just say, like, OK, you know what? I'm going to take a moment. And I'm going to connect with the Holy Spirit right now, even though I don't fully get this and allow the spirit to help shape and mold my life. That's the second way that the spirit wants to change you is through the content of scripture. Now I want to switch gears and I want you to, I want you to uh, answer this question internally today. What was the last time that you went through something that was just really painful? Think about that for a moment. Maybe it was the, the loss of a job um, or it was a, uh, you had a friendship and that severed and that's no longer there. Um, maybe it's the loss of a loved one. But think about that, that painful thing that you went through. And this might be my favorite aspect of who the Holy Spirit is. Because who the Holy Spirit is, is he is the great comforter. And sometimes the way that the Holy Spirit wants to change us is through conviction. But sometimes the way that the spirit wants to change us is by comforting us, by caring about you. Like this is part of how the Holy Spirit actually changes our hearts and our lives. The, the spirit comes with his loving kindness and he wraps his arms around you. And he says, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of you asking, God, why, why this doesn't make any sense. This is totally unfair that the spirit comes and he says, you are loved and I am with you. That's what the voice of God sounds like. And if you're hearing a different voice, it's not from God, because that's what the God, uh, the voice of God sounds like. Listen to this from, from scripture. Paul writes this, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ the father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort, comfort those who are in any affliction themselves with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Comfort, comfort, comfort. This is who the Holy Spirit is. He is the one who comes and meets you and I in the midst of our lowest spots, in the midst of our questions, and, you know, this is, this is the thing. The voice of God, it, it sounds like this every time. You are loved, you are chosen, and you are accepted. That's what the God of the universe thinks and believes about you. 
That is amazing. And here's the thing. If we will just open up our hearts to allow the spirit to speak to us, to shape us, to mold us, you will be amazed at what the spirit can do and how, will get, how he will give you exactly what you need in the exact time that you need it. And what I can tell you, it's not going to usually look like how you think it's going to look. But this is the beauty and the power of the Holy Spirit, that he wants to come and comfort you in the midst of your pain. Our fourth and final way that we're going to look at today of how the Spirit can transform us is the Holy Spirit can change us to care for others. And maybe for you, you're like, I already care for others. But, and I believe you, I wouldn't argue with you. But I, I think that the, the truth is that sometimes for you and for me, like I think even just like the way we're wired is we can first and foremost be about me, myself, and mine. It's, it's kind of it's how it is for us. But I know um, in relationship with many of you guys out here, I've interacted with you, I'm friends with you. And what I know is you don't want that to be true of yourself. You don't want to be fully, you don't want to be self-centered, self-focused. What you want is to be a person who reflects who Jesus is in our world. And this is part of the gift of the Holy Spirit is that he wants to reshape our hearts and our minds so that we are not just focused on myself and on mine, but to care deeply about others. That God actually has a mission and a purpose for you. Individual you. Like why he created you is to help be a light in this broken, messed up, dark world. That's what he wants for you. And, and I know what you're thinking. You're like, you know what? I'm, I'm broken. I'm imperfect. Like, Pastor, if you knew how messed up I really am, like it's not like I don't believe what God says, but like I've just done too much stuff. Or I think these thoughts that are horrible that I, I won't even say them to anybody. I won't even tell a counselor, let alone a friend. Like if you knew how bad it was, I just, I don't think, I don't think God can really use me in significant ways. Well, what I would point to is in scripture, we've actually read many of the words of Paul today. And Paul was this guy who, before he met Jesus, was arrogant, prideful, blasphemous. He, uh, he got Christians thrown in jail just for believing in God. He oversaw the murder of Christians. Like here's a dude who has a, has a rap sheet longer than yours. But here, here is the thing, is that God ends up using him to be one of the most influential people this planet has ever seen. And he self-identified in a letter to Timothy where he says, I am the worst of all sinners. But when he comes and he meets Jesus, Jesus transforms his heart and transforms his life that he becomes on fire for him. He's like, I have to tell everybody about the good news of who God is, how God loves them, how God has plans and purposes for their hearts and for their lives, for each and every individual that Jesus came back to save, which includes you and me. And his whole life is forever changed. And it's not just true about Paul. It's true about you and me too. And, and I love how Paul even writes this, this letter. This is, this is later in his missionary journey. He says this in Acts. And now I'm compelled by the spirit. I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what's going to happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships, they're facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. You see, the Holy Spirit transformed Paul's life, and it was for the purpose of helping care for others that they might see who God really is. And here's the thing. If you're feeling like nervous about being judged, because if you go and you tell others about who Jesus is, it's a countercultural message in our world. Like, that's, that's true. But, like, here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is actually the one who can give you the courage to be able to speak up. 
And if you're feeling like, I don't have all the words, I don't have everything that I need to say, this is also part of the gift of the Holy Spirit, is that he will give you words to say even when you don't fully know everything of what to say. And the Spirit wants to give you opportunities. This, this is crazy. The God of the universe wants to partner with you to accomplish his purposes in this world. Like, that is incredibly humbling. And, and I read these statistics that say things from like legit research firms that say Rochester is in the top 10 most post-Christian cities in our country. And I believe it. I, I'm, I don't doubt it. But you know what I also believe to be true? Is that I believe there are people all through Chilai, all through Rochester, who are hungry for connection, who are hungry to understand who their maker is, who are hungry to know who they are and who God created them to be. And I'll tell you, it's, it's tempting for all of us to go and look for that and find answers in all sorts of places to help find satisfaction. But I can tell you that there's only one who can fully fill up our heart and our soul. It is God. And I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to give you words and give you confidence to share his hope. I'm not talking about kicking down doors. I'm talking about walking through doors that God is already opening in front of you. This is, this is what, God does, what God does for you and for me. And it's when we are caring for the Holy Spirit, caring for others, that the Holy Spirit doesn't just change other people's hearts and lives, he changes ours too. Amen? Now, it's, it's not as common anymore, uh, but it used to be that in weddings, uh, there would be like a, a veil that would be a, across the, the front of the face. Um, this, is, this is actually called a blusher. I don't know, I know you, you now know I'm a wedding dress aficionado. <laughs> um, but um, what, what happens is like you can't see the, the bride's face initially, and then later in the ceremony, it's, it's lifted and you can fully see it. Paul writes this, he says, so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him, and we are changed into his glorious image. This is what the Holy Spirit wants to do for you. He wants to remove the veil so you can see the fullness and the beauty of who Jesus is, and then to shine that light to everyone around you. The Holy Spirit, he changes us in such deeper ways than any like top 10 ways to transform your life list on the internet can do. He wants to change your very most inner being, who you are, where your heart's affection ultimately lies. And I love this, I wanna end on this phrase um, that Pastor Timothy Keller he said this to a friend. He said, if you look at what Jesus did for you, then by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be changed. If you look at what Jesus did for you, then by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be changed. The Spirit wants to change your heart and change your life. Will you allow him to convict you when you're off track? Will you allow the content of scripture to shape and mold your heart? When you are suffering and when you don't have answers, will you allow the Holy Spirit to come and to comfort your heart? And finally, will you listen to his voice and allow yourself to speak up and share his love to a hurting world that is longing for him? If you want it to be true of your life, would you say amen? Amen. I'm going to have you stand and let's uh, sing this truth and solidify this in our own hearts and our